Hello and welcome to the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives. Our guest today is Chitra Diva Karuni, an award-winning uh, writer and poet uh, who has written, among other things, Mistress of Spices, which was made into a film that no doubt many of our audience has seen. Welcome, Ms. Diva Karuni. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. Tell us a little bit about Mistress of Spices, and then we'll get into some of your other work and projects that you're, you're developing as we speak. Mistress of Spices was my first novel, and it was really a departure for me. It was something very new and different that I tried to do in that book. Until then, I had been writing realistic stories of immigration. But with Mistress of Spices, I wanted to bring a magical element into my writing. And yet, I wanted to keep with the theme of immigration. So the story is about a woman in a spice shop and all of the different people who come into that shop from different parts of the community. And this is set in California, in inner city Oakland. And so it's about all of their problems and how she solves them with magical spices. And what is, if, if there is a lesson that people should take from this work, what, what would it be? What would be the main point that you're trying to share? I think one of the common and important themes in that book and much of my work is that in America we have a unique opportunity to live in a global society, in a multicultural environment. And it's very important to make the most of it, to see that as an advantage rather than as a disadvantage. And it's when Thilo, the main character of Mistress of Spices, is able to create a community out of all of these different people who come into her store that she succeeds. That's like her life's goal, and she manages to get it done. Good. Now, that was made into a film. How did the conversation start that, that led to the, to the film of the same name? Well, it was very exciting. One day I was in my office at the college where I was teaching at that time in California, and I got a phone call, and the woman on the phone said, this is Gurinder Chadha. I'm calling you from England. I've just read your book, and I'd like to make a movie out of it. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> However, it did take her several years after that to get funding for the movie, and it was only after her uh, major success with Bend It Like Beckham mm -hmm. that she was able to get the movie, and then she and her husband made Mistress of Spices together. That must have been an exciting moment for you when it came out. Yes. And then you've also had um, same success with another one of your works. Yes, Sister of My Heart was made into an Indian movie. It was a TV movie in India. It was made in the language Tamil, which is one of the South Indian languages. So that was also very exciting. It was a big hit. It was a mini series. And it was like so, it was so popular that they kept extending <laughs> the series. <laughs> So that was very exciting. It won a lot of awards. I myself don't speak that language, but they did send me a DVD, and I looked at everything. And it looked very, it, it, it was very interesting, because my book is set in Bengal, and they had moved the whole thing to South India, and they put it in a South Indian context. And I thought, isn't that wonderful how art grows from one form to something else in another form? And I was perfectly fine with it. So tell us uh, about some of your current work. You have a relatively new book out. That's right. I have uh, two books, actually. Two books. I'm in the happy position that one of my books has just come out in paperback, and that's The Palace of Illusions. Now, that, too, is a very different project. I like to do that from, with each book to take on a new kind of challenge. So Palace of Illusions is the retelling of one of our ancient epics, the Mahabharat. And I've retold it from the point of view of one of the main characters, a woman character. And that was intentional. I wanted to put a woman in, at the center of this story. And my other book is one of my children's books because I write for adults yes. and for children. And it's, it's a great delight to write for children. And this is called Shadowland. And it's the third and final book in a trilogy that I've been writing. They're all standalones, but in this one, um, this is also an environmentally 
oriented book mm -hmm. because the main characters go into a world where uh, the world has been devastated by various things that people have done to it. And so I hope that this book, in addition to being a fun read, will allow children to start thinking about the environment and how we are all responsible for what happens to it. Good, good. Now that's aimed at children of what ages? Children of nine and up. Nine and up. Yes, uh -huh. ages nine and up. But actually, I get a lot of comments from adults who really do like my children's <laughs> books. And I personally, as a reader, have always enjoyed well-written children's books. Now, is that something that might be developed into a film? Well, the first one of the series, titled The Conch Bearer, has been optioned. Oh, good. So I'm kind of excited about that. This is exciting that. across the board. <laughs> Yes, yes, I think it would be wonderful if it were made into a movie. And now, you know, the director is looking for funding. So maybe if there are people listening to us right now and they get excited, <laughs> they can fund the Who movie. knows? We have a potentially very large audience. Tell us a little bit about what you're working on that we haven't seen yet. Is there something you can tell us about your next major work? without revealing too much? <laughs> yes, certainly. No, I'm happy to. For this one, I go back to, uh, or I come forward, I should say, to contemporary culture and contemporary society. And this novel is titled One Amazing Thing. And I'm about, I'm getting towards the end of it. It should come out next year. And it's about a group of people who are trapped in an Indian passport office by an earthquake. So this passport office is in Northern California, and uh, it's about what happens to all of them when they get trapped there. They can't get out. They start learning about each other. They learn why everyone is wanting to go to India. And it's, I guess it's a, no it's a novel about what we do when disaster strikes. We can respond in a positive way or in a negative way. And I think that's an important thing for all of us to consider in our lives. If something really, you know, difficult happens to us, how are we going to, how are we going to deal with it? Because I think that's what makes a human being special. Now tell us a little bit about how you approach writing. There are some writers who can write on very tight schedules and produce a book every 365 days, just like clockwork, and others who are, are much more laid back and let things evolve. But wh are you one of those or in, in your own different place? I think I'm a little bit of each. I do like to create a schedule for myself and keep with it. Uh, writing is very important to me, so I give it like priority. So I'll carve out sections of my day. I can't do it every day because I teach also at the university of Houston, and that's very important to me. But on the days that I'm home and working from home, a major chunk of each day is for writing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really been very helpful for me because it's created a discipline for me. And that works well for, for me. It's not for every writer, but it works well for me. I do recommend to my students that they create a routine mm -hmm. because I think in a way writing is like many other arts. If you do it regularly, not only do you get better at it, but it's like your whole being at that time wants to write because it's been conditioned that this is writing time. Mm -hmm. And that's very helpful. I think for me at least, it um, sidesteps often, not always, but that whole idea of writer's block. Uh -huh. Well, that, w that was actually going to be my next question. Everyone seems to assume that successful writers never have the writer's block problem, but you know that's not true. And, that's and, and, absolutely and not. When does it happen to you uh, often, and, and how do you deal with it? It happens often enough, too often. <laughs> of course, one never wants it to happen, right? But it does happen, and I've come to terms with it. And as long as it doesn't continue for beyond a certain amount of time, I'm OK with it. I've understood some things about why writer's block strikes me, at least. And having spoken to many other writers and to my students, I think this may be true for 
many people, which is I get writer's block when I don't understand my project, as in I don't understand what should be happening in the novel, or I don't understand a particular character and her motivations. So I have to figure those things out in my head. Often I have to figure them out just by free writing or jotting down notes or writing in my journal. And once I figure it out, then the writer's block is gone. Then I know what to do next. So that's one kind of writer's block. The other kind is when I'm taking on a task and I know it's very challenging, I'm trying to write a particular scene perhaps, it's a very difficult scene to write because it's very complex. And then I think I'm just scared, and then I get writer's block. And the only way to do it is to say to myself, just go ahead and write, and if you mess up, you know, no one has to know. You that's can right, just, that's right. No you can just click know. and it's <laughs> deleted. Well, that, I think that'll be helpful for our viewers, especially those who are taking writing classes and often run into the writer's block problem. Uh, as you know, we have a relatively new India program here at the University of Central Florida, and that's one of the reasons we're, we're especially happy you're, you're here. Uh, the program focuses on everything from politics and technology to communication and culture. And um, I'm, I'm interested in uh, how you maintain your connections with uh, Indian culture. You've lived in the United States for a long time, but you undoubtedly go back on a, on a regular basis. Could you tell us a little bit about how that enriches your, your perspective about India and how it relates to your writing? Certainly, but first I wanted to say I'm so pleased that you have this India program and this cultural and technological exchange, exchanges on many levels. Um, I think that is so important everywhere, but especially at a university because in, in some ways, that's what makes students grow beyond the classroom and connect to the world and become global citizens. And I think today, more than ever before, that's very important. Uh, the way I myself connect to India is my mother still lives there, and I have many other relatives, and I go back from time to time. And just that physical going back is very important, just seeing how India is progressing, growing, evolving, changing. Um, that's very important for me as a, just as a human being and as a person of Indian origin, but also as a writer because I write about India so much. And even if my writing, whether my writing is set in current day um, India or whether it's set in the past, it's important for me to know what's happening and what people are thinking about. But now I have to say that with the internet, it's become so much easier. I am, this, okay, I have to tell you this. So this year, I, I made a resolution because my children are always going on. I have two teenagers. They're always going on and on about, Mom, you are so on-tech savvy. Mom, what are you going to do when we go off to college? <laughs> you know, Will you even be able to turn on the TV? <laughs> so I was like, this year I'm going to learn as much as I can about the Internet. So I've really been using the Internet, and it is just wonderful. The, the potential of knowing about the world through the Internet is just wonderful. And one of the ways I think I'm able to learn a lot about India is by reading blogs on the internet. The wonderful Indian blogs, very interesting. And they tell you things that like the papers will never tell right. you. <laughs> so I get the feel that I'm learning about like the subculture of India a lot more than I could ever have before. And literature, I love reading books by Indian writers writers living there, writers living here and writing about there, writers writing about the back and forth. All of those things are fascinating. So when was your last trip? Last uh, year. Last year. Yes. And was that just a family visit or did you have other goals associated with it? Well, usually when I go to India, you know, my publisher or publishers in India um, that are publishing my books there or people who are doing literary festivals, People are all very interested to do something with me. It's been very nice. So I usually try to combine business and pleasure. So I'll go, I'll do. This, this last time I went, it was for a literature and film festival that was taking place in Delhi called the Oceans Festival. 
and they had invited me. It was very um, exciting and wonderful to be with many Indian writers and filmmakers and writers and filmmakers that had come from other countries. And so I did that for about a week, and then I went and spent some quiet time with my mother in Calcutta, Kolkata. Now, do you ever have the experience of being in India or someplace else, and in an instant, you'll get an idea to write something that eventually turns into a short story or a book or something else? Uh, does that happen very often? Not very often, but it has happened. And one of the things, and that's very exciting when you get that kind of aha moment and you think, maybe, you know, maybe I could write about this. Maybe this would become a book. And then I have a writer's journal and I write things down. Yes. And do and, you refer back to that from time to time to see if ideas have developed beyond yes, the seed? Yes, absolutely. I, I keep looking back at my writer's journal. And I'll give you just one, mo one example which is on a previous trip about 10 years back, I'd gone to see my mother and we had gone to see another relative. And when we were in the house of this other relative who lived in an old part of Kolkata, there was a lot of noise outside. And I said, well, what's happening? And our relative told us, oh, the old house that belongs to the Mukherjee's for about a century is being broken down and a high rise is going to go up in its place. And I thought, well, you know, and people didn't think anything of it because things like that happen all the time. But I was like, this is an example of how an entire way of life is passing out of the culture. And I said, I want to write a story about a family who would have lived in an old house like that centuries old house, they would have lived there as a joint family, and now their way of life is changing. And that idea became Sister of My Heart. Oh, okay. That's terrific. <laughs> but it doesn't happen very often. But it often. doesn't happen very often. <laughs> it's a gift when it comes. When, when you go to different institutions, especially those that have um, programs focused on India, have you noticed anything about them that is um, striking that would be worth sharing? And, and what are the opportunities that you see for creating links among the institutions, especially in the United States, and then between those institutions and similar institutions in, in India, so that we can enlarge the conversation about these topics? Well, enlarging the conversation is very important. I think what I've noticed at the University of Houston, for example, is that they've been really encouraging uh, students and faculty from India to come over. So there's been an exchange on both sides, and people from here are going over there. And that, I think, is a great way uh, to start and to change the atmosphere on both campuses where this exchange is happening. So I like that. and then. It's wonderful because then we get to see those students and faculty sometimes in our departments, sometimes in our classrooms, and we can find out firsthand what's going on in India. I like that. Now, wh when they come, do they just stay at the university, or do, does the university share them with the community and with other academic institutions? They do share them with other academic institutions. They create um, community events for them to interact. Mm -hmm. And I think I like that, too. I think that's very important. So everyone in the city who wants to can come and have a conversation. And of course, the local Indian community always gets very interested in it. And that's good, because then they become involved in the program. And then, you know they want to donate to the program. Which yes, is that's, always that's good. always <laughs> nice. Now, is the community in Houston sizable? Yes, it's a very large Indian community there. I think we're the fourth or fifth largest in the nation. And do you find that people contact you or try to contact you on a regular basis because they know who you are through your books and the films that have been made of them? Yes, they do. And I interact a lot with the Indian community, which anyway is important for me. I like to stay in touch with you know, my community, my culture. But it's particularly important for me as a writer because 
when I observe people and I observe what's going on in the community and I observe changes, that gives me ideas for writing. And I used to joke and say that for my first book, Arranged Marriage, which was a collection of stories, I got the ideas from for most of those stories just from eavesdropping at Indian <laughs> parties. <laughs> And then the names change, and you, you, well, sometimes life is better than fiction, right? <laughs> you certainly get, I get a lot of my inspiration just by listening to people's stories. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So when is your next trip to India? I'm hoping next year. It's, you know, it's always tricky to find the right time to do that. And also, my mother, um, she likes to come over here from time to time. So if it's a year when she's going to come, then I'm not going to go. I will just enjoy her company here and maybe take her around to see other relatives. So, But I'm hoping I will go next year. But one of our plans, my husband and I talk about this from time to time, just in about three years, both of our children will be in college. And then perhaps he will take um, an assignment in India, oh. and we might go and live there for at least a year, maybe two years. That would which, be enriching. Yes, it would be very enriching because truly India has changed so much. And if I, weren't, if I were to write a book, a novel about this new India, I strongly feel I have to live there. Mm -hmm. And I can write shorter pieces based on things that I see. But I really need to live there. So what advice would you give to young people who may be listening to us today about uh, who are interested in India, how, how should they approach uh, that, that interest? Should they obviously travel, but beyond that, what might they do to learn travel. more? Travel is always wonderful because you get a firsthand experience. I think if you're traveling, though, it's a good idea to prepare yourself for that travel by reading ahead. And as I said, you know, on the internet, we have so many sources. Um, of finding out about India. But ultimately, as a writer, I feel that literature is one of the best and lasting ways to understand the deeper things about a culture, the deeper ideas, um, the things that continue over generations and centuries. So I would really recommend to them to read as widely as they can, not just the contemporary writers writing today, but also the older writers, to get a sense of the history of the culture. So, so that's what I would say to them. Read Indian writers. Start with me. I always like to ask writers what they're reading at the moment, whether it's an Indian writer or, or someone else. Is there a book you've read recently or are reading that you might recommend? Yes, actually, I'm rereading at this moment uh, Kiran Desai's book, The Inheritance of Loss. And as you know, that was a Booker Prize winner. It's a very well-written book. It's kind of a dark novel, but it's, it gives you a very good idea of forces in India, forces that are working right now to create a very complex situation, mm -hmm. a complex political situation. And it also touches on the immigrant experience and the problems with that experience. Okay, well on that note, I think we'll end. Ms. Diva Karuni, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you, and thank you for the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.